in continuation with our discussion on undecidability, we are now going to introduce another problem known as tiling problem and so that this problem is also undecidable. Now, the tiling problem is like this, given a finite set of tiles that means, finite set of types of tiles. The problem is to tile the first quadrant of the x y plane satisfying the given constraints. For example, suppose given and given red and black tiles. So, these are types of tiles. So, this set is set of two elements R and B, R represents red tiles and B represents black tiles. So, in this case, what we assume that tiles from of each type will be available infinitely. So, there are infinite numbers of tiles of each of the types either red or black. So, given this red and black tiles, we have to tile the first quadrant in such a way that no two adjacent tiles are the same color. So, these are constants. So, there will be some constants satisfying this constant we need to tile taking tiles from this kind this, this, this set. So, we need to tile the first quadrant of the x y pen. So, this is the problem. So, in this example. Now, <coughs> if you consider this example, so we can have this kind of tiling. Suppose, the first quadrant is suppose uh, it is filled up with R that is red. Then, according to the condition, since the second one horizontally, this one can be filled by only black tiles. So, next one can be tiled by a a red tile and so on. That means, we can place alternate types of tiles horizontally. Similarly, above R again we can have this B, which is the only possibility because we cannot have the same color. Then after B we can have this R vertically. So, horizontally vertically we can fill up like that. So, once this B is fixed, we can fill the remaining tiles like this after B it is R, then B and so on and the condition is satisfied both horizontally and vertically. So, therefore, this is tiling that means, that way you can tile the whole first quadrant of the x y plane given infinite numbers of numbers of red and black tiles. Now, <coughs> if we insist that there is a condition is that the left bottom center line is red that means, the first one in the quadrant uh, the left bottom center of this uh, quadrant, if it is fixed suppose it is R red, red tile, then there is only one solution for this problem. Similarly, if it is say black, then also we have only one solution. Now, given this kind of problem, so, what you can do is that suppose just consider this particular tile. So, this particular tile can be identified as the coordinate say 3 3 is a left bottom corner say this 3 3 left bottom corner. Then right bottom corner is your 3 4 3 then the top left top corner is 4 so it is 3 4 and the right top corner is 4 4 so we can identify this tile by giving the coordinate on the various corners, but simply if we give the coordinate of the leftmost left bottom corner, so this one, then so we can identify this tile. If we have the convention that we will always give the coordinate of the left bottom corner, then if it is suppose M n is the coordinate of the left bottom corner, then horizontally you can keep on increasing the 
x value that means m plus 1 n will be the right bottom corner. Similarly, m n plus 1 will be the left top corner and m plus 1 n plus 1 will be the right top corner. So, that way if we give the coordinate of the left bottom corner it is sufficient to identify a particular tile. <coughs> so, we always identify a tile by giving the left bottom coordinate of the left bottom corner. Now, once we have that convention formally we can define tiling system like this. So, formally a tiling system is a quadruple having four elements d where d is a finite set of tiles that means the type of types of tiles. Then d 0 it is called the initial tile that is a condition which tile should be used to put the coordinate 0 0. Then h is subset of d cross d it is called horizontal constants. So, it has to satisfy that constant and similarly v is also a subset of d cross d called vertical constants. So, once we have this tiling system, suppose the tiling system is d, a tiling by d is a function from n cross n to d, where d is the types of tiles such that f 0 0 is d 0 that is the first condition that means, which tile should be used at a coordinate 0 0. Then this is a horizontal condition f m n and f m plus 1 n that means, once we fix consider this tile in the location coordinate m n then the tile which will be there horizontally the next one it must satisfy the constant given in this tiling system for all m n in n. Similarly, this represents a vertical condition. If we fix the tile m n, then m n plus 1 it is it should satisfy the vertical condition given in v for all m n. So, given a tiling system a tiling by d is a function satisfying all these constants. Now, the problem is that given a tiling system whether or not it has a tiling. So, that is the problem. What we want to show is that the tiling problem is undecidable. For any given tiling, the tiling problem that means, given a tiling whether or not it has only it has tiling this problem is undecidable. <coughs> to, pr to prove we use a reduction from a variant of the holding problem. We prove this by reducing the problem the complement of H 1 we will define H 1 now. We reduce the complement of H 1 to the tiling problem. Since H 1 is undecidable H 1 complement is undecidable and therefore, this tiling problem must also be undecidable according to the reduction. Now, how to define h 1 the variant? So, h 1 is basically or the language of h 1 or simply h 1 is a set of all Turing machines m such that Turing machine starting with a blank tap. So, it starts at the start set q 0 and it initially the tap is empty it starts with blank tap and eventually it enters in a halt state. This is a halting set H and there will be some content on the string. And we can show that this problem H 1 is also undecidable. That means, given a Turing machine if it starts with a blank tap whether it will eventually halt or not. So, if H 1 is undecidable then so is the complement of H 1. That means, given a Turing machine, any arbitrary Turing machine, 
the Turing machine does not halt. This, this is a problem. So, this is a H1 complement. So, we can show that H1 is undecidable by reducing the halting problem to this variant of this halting problem and hence H1 complement is also undecidable. So, we will leave this as an exercise to show that H1 complement is undecidable. Now, we will use this problem complement of H1 to prove that the tiling problem is also undecidable. We will reduce this H1 complement to the tiling problem to prove this. Now, consider the following Turing machine which is in H1 complement. That means, this Turing machine never holds, which will start in a blank tap and it will never hold. So, what this Turing machine does is that it has two states Q0 and Q1. Q0 is the initial state reading a blank symbol which is a hash, blank is written by hash. So, it will enter in Q1 and prints A. So, this blank symbol will be converted to A and it will change its state to Q1. So, when it is in Q1, it simply goes to the right side whenever it sees an A and it changes its state to Q0. So, since towards the right side we have infinite numbers of blanks only, again in Q0 looking at blank, it will print A and send state to Q1 and Q1 since the input is A, it will go to the right side, here it will move to the right side and it will send state to Q0. So, this will continue. That means, if the content is initially say all has is all has or blank so on. So, initially this situation is in Q 0. So, this has will be or blank will be modified to A and it will go to sorry this has will be modified to A, will be A will be printed and it will send state to Q 1 and Q 1 reading a symbol A it will simply go to right side and then it will send state to Q 0. Q 0 again looking at has or blank it will simply print A and it will go to state Q 1 and Q 1 since it is A it will again move to one side one cell to the right and this will continue. So, therefore, all these A's will be all these blanks will be converted to A and it will keep on going since we have infinitely many blanks towards the right side of the tap. So, therefore, competition of the steering machine will never halt. That means, Q 0 the tap is uh, head is reading blank, it will enter in the state Q 1. So, this is the next configuration, configuration Q 1 A will be printed. Next configuration is that Q 1 to it will go to Q 0 and it will go one cell towards the right side. So, A is always there and then next head is pointing to the next blank. So, this will continue. So, eventually Q 1 A A A where head is pointing to A and so on. Just considering this Turing machine, <coughs> what you can do is that. So, the idea is that once a Turing machine is given so, this Turing machine competition a conf successive configurations of the Turing machine can be used to fill up the first quadrant by filling the one row of the first quadrant by successive configurations of the Turing machine. That means, so initially it is a Q 0 has. So, initially all are blank. So, we put in the first quadrant and in first row of the first quadrant. This Q 0 indicates that this is a star state. So, Q 0 has and then 
and q 0 blank and all blank. So, this is the initial configuration and we have placed in the first row. Next q 0 on reading blank it enters in state q 1 and prints a over here and remaining are same. So, therefore, we simply use the next configuration to fill up the second row next row. So, next q 1 on a will simply go to. So, the head will be moved towards the right side according to our rule q 1 on a will go to the right side and will change that to q 0. So, therefore, the config next configuration will be so q 1 on a. So, this a will remain same it will be carried forward and then will enter in state q 0 and this is has blank. So, this state symbol is used in a cell to indicate that indicate the state and that it is reading that the corresponding symbol. So, the next configuration will have a will be there. So, q 0 has q 0 blank. So, this will convert to a and it will enter in state q 1 and then remaining are same all are blank. Again the next it will be a it will a. So, it will enter in state q 0 is blank 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 so on. So, this way we can keep on filling up the rows of the first quadrant by successive configuration of the Turing machine. Since the Turing machine never holds, so therefore we will be able to have a tiling of the first quadrant according accordingly. So this is what we use for tiling the first quadrant given a Turing machine. Now let us prove this formally. So given a Turing machine M, which is a quadruple q sigma delta q 0. We define the tiling system from this Turing machine. So, it is d m. We emphasize that this tiling system has been constructed from m the Turing machine given Turing machine m. So, our idea is that given a Turing machine m we need to have a tiling system such that Turing machine never holds, Turing machine does not hold if and only if it has a tiling. So, from M we have a we have constructed instance of tiling. So, that we can have a tiling of this instance if and only if the Turing machine never holds. So, it has again For given a Turing machine M, we define the corresponding Turing machine for this Turing machine D M, which is a quadruple having four elements capital D, D0, H, and V, where capital D is the set of tiles and types of tiles. So, D0 is the initial condition, and H and V are horizontal and vertical conditions, which has the following types of tiles. So, in this tiling system, we will have the tiles according to the transitions of the Turing machine. Corresponding to every Turing machine, we will have some kinds of tiles. Now, for all A in sigma, we will have this kind of tiles. So, what I say is that this kind of tile is used to simply communicate any unchanged symbol upwards from configuration to configuration. So, it has content A. And on the edge, on the top edge, we have the symbol A. So, this simply communicates that there will be some symbol which are unchanged. For example, so in this case, we have this A, and here also we have this A. So, this is A. So, we just carry forward the symbol A. So, accordingly, we will be using this kind of tiles. And here, 
we have used a dot over here to just to indicate that to use this kind of tile, we must have some tile below it. If we want to use this tile, some tiles below it must be already available. Then for all a b in sigma and for all p q in the state of the Turing machine. If we have a transition like this in a Turing machine delta p a equal to q b, it says that we have p a as a element. So, p a will be there in the tile as a content of the tile and the top is it is q b. It communicates the head position upwards and also sense of the symbol and the state appropriately. That means, from the tile below, tile upward the head position is sensed and the state is sensed from P to Q and the symbol is sensed from A to B. So, that happens whenever you have delta P A equal to Q B, we have a state sense from P to Q and we print a new symbol instead of A and that is your B instead of A we print a B. So, that is what we communicate over here. Again to use this kind of tiles we need to have a tile below it that is indicated by this dot. Then again for all A B in sigma and P Q in Q, if we have this kind of transition delta P A equal to Q R that means, is a right move of the head if the Turing machine is in state P reading symbol A, it will go to state Q and the head will be moved towards the right side by one cell. For this, we will be using these two tiles. Uh, it simply communicate head movement one square from left to right. So, P A is the content of this tile P A. And since head is moved towards the right side, this A will be carried forward. It goes to the right side, changing in state Q, and it goes to the right right side. So in the next case, whatever may be the symbol, it may be B. So this B will be there, but the state will be this state Q. And both the cases, we must have some tile below it. So, this communicates the movement of the head one square to the right and the sense of state appropriately. Similarly, for all a b and p q a b in sigma and p q in state q, if delta p q equal to q l. So, this type of style types of tiles basically communicates the movement of the head towards the left side by one position. So, delta P A, so P A is the content of this tile. So, A will be carried forward, it will be communicated upwards. So, it changes state from P to Q and it goes towards the left side. So, therefore, from left side it comes Q. Whatever may be the content, earlier content of this tile. So, next it will be Q B. The state will be changed to q and b will be carried forward. And in both the cases, we need to have some tiles below it. And then from the initial condition, since in the initial configuration, we will start with the state q 0 and blank. And towards the right side, we have only blank. So, therefore, we will use this kind of tile to fill the first cell. And for all the remaining cells, initially we will be using say blank and towards the left side and right side we will have all blanks and these blanks will be carried forward. So, that is why we are using this blank. So, in both these cases you just know that no there is no necessary to have any other tiles below these tiles. So, that is why we are not using any dots, because those will be used for 
initial configuration. Now, we have constructed a tiling system. So, basically in this tiling system what we have done is that we have shown what are the types of tiles to be used. So, all these types of tiles and we have constructed those tiles from the corresponding moves, moves of the Turing machine. And at the same time what I have done is that we have said indicated here the vertical condition. For example, here from A this A will be carried forward. So, here again we will have P A and it will be Q B. So, this gives the vertical condition and in this case again we have this horizontal condition, horizontal condition and so on. So, while constructing these tiles at the same time we have also indicated what should be the corresponding horizontal conditions and vertical conditions by giving the content of the tile and what should be near the top of the tile or towards the right or towards the left. Now, when to show that <coughs> given in Turing machine M, this belongs to H1 complement if and only if d m has a tiling. That means, this is a reduction from the complement of the tile uh, complement of this h 1 h 1 to the tiling tiling problem. So, given tuning machine m if it belongs to h 1 complement if and only it belongs to h 1 complement if and only if the corresponding tiling system has a tiling. Let us prove the forward direction. Suppose M is a Turing machine with the following elements Q is the set of states, sigma is the state of symbols, delta is a transition, and Q naught is the start state. And this does not halt when started on a blank tape because this is an instance of H1 complement since it is an instance of H1 complement, this M does not halt when it started on a blank tap. So, therefore, the first configuration will be like this C 0, Q 0 it starts on a blank tap therefore, the head is reading blank and towards the right side there are all blanks. Then we will go to C 1 and C 2 and so on by computing according to transition of the Turing machine. And eventually suppose that particular configuration is a C i, it will be of this form say Q i A 0 A 1 up to say A j i and up to A k i. So, where A 0 A 1 up to A k i these are all symbols from the alphabet sigma. And then it will go to next configuration C i plus 1 and so on and the computation never terminates, it is never ending computation, it does not halt. Just consider this configuration C i, considering this any arbitrary configuration C i, we will see the tiling, we will we'll give the tiling. We we'll give the tiling like this, the tiling function from n cross n to the set of tiles is like this. The types of tiles we have we already know how to construct from the types of from the construction that we have already described. So, for all i greater than 0 f of n i that means, what should be the tile for this coordinate n i? It will be a n simply a n the tile with content a n. If n is greater than equal to 0 and less than k i, but n not equal to j i. That means, it says that if it is within this other than this one, if it is not a j i, it will retain the all our symbols will be carried forward. So, a 0 will go to the next configuration, a 1 go to the next configuration up to a j i minus 1 will go to the next configuration 
in the upward direction. Similarly, A j i plus 1 up to A k i will go upward in the next configuration, the next row. But if n equal to j i, then the correspondent will be q i a j i. So, because the current state is q i and a scanning the symbol say a j i. And if it is greater than k i, then after k i there is all blank because we have come up to a k i and we started with an, an empty tip. So, therefore, all the cells towards the right most symbol will be all blank and hence if n is greater than k i we will be using this kind of threads. So, once we use this kind of tiles. So, corresponding to this Turing machine, we will construct the tiling system and then if we consider the configurations start with C 0, we put it in the first row of the first quadrant x of the x y plant and then according to the move to the Turing machine, we will get the next configuration <coughs> and the tiles that we will be using will be of the kind that we have already described according to the configuration construction Turing machine and so on. So, therefore, this gives a proper mapping what tile to be used for tiling the first quadrant. So, that way we will be able to tile since the Turing machine never holds we will be able to tile the first quadrant of the x y plane. Now, consider the converse. Suppose, the tiling system has a tiling. Say, there is a mapping from n cross n to d. So, there is a tiling. Now, note that as per the construction of the tiling system d m from the Turing machine given Turing machine m, the tile which can be accommodated in the first row are of this kind q 0 blank and blank and there is no tile below it, because that is the only possibility since we below it we do not have any other tiles and the respecting tiling must be q 0 blank then blank then blank and so on all blanks. Clearly, this represents the initial configuration of the Turing machine m when started with empty tip this must be the initial configuration. Therefore, C 0 is Q 0 blank the head is reading the blank symbol. Then since we have constructed the tiling system from the given Turing machine. So, what the next tile to be used above this will be defined or will be decided according to the transition of the Turing machine. Since we have a tiling, there must be some tiles to use above it in the first row and then in the next row and this will continue forever because there is a tiling that's what, that is what that is what we have said. because d m has a tiling. Since it is a tiling, we will be able to fill up all the rows like this, but in this case what we have used is that this tiling system has been constructed from the Turing machine only. That means, it clearly says the Turing machine has moves. Since the tiling is will continue infinitely, so therefore, the competition of the Turing machine also will go on infinitely that means, from C 0 it will go to C 1, C 1 to C 2 and so on from C i to C i plus 1 for all i. So, 
will continue forever. So, that means, if there is a tiling, there must be uh, the Turing machine will never hold that is what we have got. So, therefore, so this shows that for any given Turing machine M, if M, uh, M Turing machine M, M belongs to H 1 complement if and only if D M has a tiling where D M is the corresponding tiling system. Now, we have already seen many problems that have been shown to be undecidable. For example, the halting problem, we have seen defined and proved the work problem to be undecidable. We have simply defined PCP, we did not prove of course, and now we have shown that defined the tiling problem and shown it to be undecidable. Similarly, you can keep on giving more and more problems to be undecidable. We will say that some variants of the halting problem, for example, say H 0 and H 1, which are used in the context. For example, H 1 is used to show that halting problem is undecidable, uh, sorry, tiling problem is undecidable. Similarly, H 0 was used to show that the war problem is undecidable. So, this variance of Turing holding problem H 0 and H 1 are also undecidable that we left as exercise. More such variance of the holding problem can be defined and proved to be undecidable. <coughs> Similarly, we can give we have shown that P C P is undecidable and then P C P can be used to prove that some problems related to say especially context free languages to be undecidable. We have already shown that given grammar, given a CFG, whether G is ambiguous. Is G ambiguous? So, this problem is basically for any arbitrary CFG is undecidable. We used PCP to show that the ambiguity problem of CFG is undecidable. Similarly, we can show that given a CFG G 1 and CFG G 2, whether L of G 1 intersection L of G 2 equal to phi. So, this problem is also undecidable. We can easily show it by using the same construction that was used in case of PCP, in case of showing that ambiguity problem of CFG is undecidable. For example, just consider Say there is an instance of PCP, say it is x1, y1, x2, y2, up to say xn, yn. So, from this instance of a PCP, we will construct grammars g1 and g2, we will construct conductive grammars such that that P C P instance P has a solution if and only if L of G 1 and L of G 2 is non empty. Now, the construction is actually similar that we have described in case of showing that a given arbitrary grammar is ambiguous or not is undecidable. For example, we introduce a new set of symbols say a 1, a 2 up to say a n as many symbols as their lists as their pairs of pairs in the P C P. And then in G 1 we have productions like S 1 goes to a i S 1 x i and a i x i for all i. Similarly, 
in G 2 we have S 2 goes to A i S 2 y i and A i y i. So, we can now easily show that L of G 1 interaction L of G 2 is non empty if and only if this PCB instance P has a solution. So, if because if this instance of PCP has a solution, so there must be some sequence say I 1, I 2, some I k, which is solution to this PCP such that x i 1, x i 2 up to x i k equal to y i 1, y i 2 up to y i k. So, this two are must be same because there is a solution to the PCP, this sequence is a solution to the PCP. So, according to the definition of PCP, so this two must be same. But in case of G 1 and G 2, we have seen that if we consider A I 1 or A I k a i k minus 1 up to a i 1 x i 1 x i 2 up to x i k. So, for this string there is a derivation in g 1 starting with s 1. So, s 1 derives this string. Similarly, s 2 derives this string a i k a i k minus 1 up to a i 1 x sorry y i 1 y i 2 up to y i k. Now, since the first part is same a i k to a i 1 a i k to a i 1 and x i 1 to x i up to x i k this is identical to y i 1 to y i k. So, these two strings must be identical it is the same. So, therefore, this string and this string belongs to both since it's, we started with S 1 in G started with S 2 in G some derivation we can always derive like this. So, therefore, interaction L 1 and G 1 is not empty. So, this string is common to both the languages L of G 1 and L of G 2. Similarly, you can prove the converse that means, the PCP has a solution if and only if L of G 1 and L of G 2 has some common element. Now, <coughs> similarly we can define or give many other problems related to context free grammar and so that they are all undecidable by reducing P C P to those problems. Now, please note that the theory of undecidability is concerned with determining whether or not there exist algorithms for solving problems. So, that is what we want to know does there exist any algorithm for solving any given problem. If it exists then it is decidable otherwise it is not decidable. Now, <coughs> People started giving algorithms or knowledge of algorithms were known to people since long. It is only at the beginning of 20th, 20th century that means 1900 that people started about thinking whether there exists any algorithm or not for any given problem. They started with an address given by David Hilbert in 1900. So, he posed many problems to the community at that time. So, one of those problems was like this, there is a tenth problem devise a process using which it can be determined by a finite number of operations whether a polynomial has an integral root. 
that means devise a process devising a process using which can be determined by a finite number of operations it means that he wanted to devise an algorithm that is the notion of algorithm that was known to us so, devise an algorithm to determine whether a polynomial has an integral root or not that means if we have a polynomial like this say 13 x cube y z square minus 6 x y cube plus 7 say y square z minus 2 y plus 100. So, it is a polynomial involving three variables x y and z. So, it will have a root if we have an assignment some x equal to something some value of x y and z such that those values when you put here it satisfies to 0 it becomes equal to 0. So, it is a root. So, the question is whether we have an integral root whether some integers value we can put over here x y and z so that it becomes equal to 0. So, apparent assumption was that such an algorithm must exist. So, Hilbert's assumption was that it was it exists and one need to simply devise this algorithm, but it took almost 70 years to prove that no such algorithm exists to determine whether a polynomial has an integral root. This was proved by Matija Sevis in 1970. It took long 70 years to show that no such algorithm actually exists to determine whether any given arbitrary polynomial has an in integral root or not. Now, during that period a clear definition of algorithm was not available. What is meant by an algorithm? Instead, an intuitive notion of algorithm was only known, but the intuitive concept of algorithm may be sufficient to give algorithm for certain problems, but it is not enough to show that there exist no algorithms for any given problem. That means, people were lacking that time a clear definition of algorithm. There is a long wait of almost 35 years for a clear definition of algorithm. And eventually it was given via Searle's Turing thesis. In 36, 1936, Alan Searle developed lambda calculus which is a notational system and Alan Turing developed Turing machine which is computing or abstract machine. And it was shown that lambda calculus and Turing machine these two notions are equivalent. An intuitive notion of algorithm is equivalent to Turing machine algorithm. This is basically known as Searle's Turing thesis. So, that means, we can define an algorithm by designing by giving a Turing machine. An undecidability of the halting problem was proved by Turing in 36. In case of Hilbert's and problem, we can define the corresponding language like this. So, L of p is a set of all polynomial p, p is a polynomial with an integral root. So, the problem is given a polynomial p, whether or not p belongs to L p, this language is undecidable. The problem is of course, decidable for polynomials that have only one variable. For example, if we have a variable involving only say x say <coughs> suppose we have a variable I mean a polynomial say involving say 6 uh, x to the power 7 minus 2 x to the power 5 plus and so on only x variable is only x. So, in such a case what a Turing machine can do is that it can compute the polynomial for different values of x starting at 0, put x equal 0, compute the value of the polynomial. If it is 0, it is fine it will stop, otherwise it will compute the value of polynomial for x equal to 1, 
and x equal to minus 1. If at any point it becomes 0, then it will stop, otherwise it will continue in both direction with 2 and minus 2, then minus 3 and 3. So, it will continue and so on until it finds a solution. But the point is that such same thing can be used for multi -value, multi variable problem also for x, y, z and so on. Suppose, we have take different values of x, y, z and keep on evaluating the polynomial until it becomes 0. But that means, we have Turing machine to do this, but whether it is a decider or not that is not known. In case of single variable, we need not go infinitely many steps. So, we can stop at some point whenever we do not find a solution and say that this has no integral root or if we find any, we will stop the three will stop saying that it has an integral root. So, up to what limit will go? It can be said that it is plus minus k some c max by say c 1, where k is the number of terms in the polynomial. How many terms are there? And c max is the coefficient with largest absolute value and c 1 is basically the coefficient of the highest order term. So, we will keep on going like this until up to this limit until it finds a root. If it does not find a root, it will say that declare that there is no integral root for this polynomial. So, therefore, for single variable the problem is solvable, but for multi variable the problem is not solvable and it was proved by Matthias Seifis in 1970 only that for multi variable case the problem is unsolvable.